The Marvel Handbook, Episode 10, A, Avengers, Avengers Mansion, Avengers Quinjet, and Autocron. Face front, true believers. Stan Lee presents Diabulu Frank. Editorial. The Marvel Universe began 21 years ago with the publication of Fantastic Four number one in November 1961. The Fantastic Four weren't at all like the cardboard cutout heroes who populated other companies' comics. They had life, vitality, and personality. At last, there were comic stories that even adults could appreciate. The FF was a hit, and quickly, Marvel Comics, which up until then had been known as Timely Slash Atlas, followed with other heroes of equal appeal. The Hulk, Thor, Spider-Man, Ant-Man, Iron Man, and Doctor Strange. These heroes, and the many who came later share the humanness and vitality that characterized the Fantastic Four. But what is more remarkable and important is that all of these heroes shared the same world. Before the Marvel heroes came along, comic characters seemed entrenched in their own private, isolated worlds, seldom to intermingle or even acknowledge one another's existence. But the Marvel heroes from the beginning were different. Their adventures were set in a common universe. Heroes and villains would pop up in each other's magazines without fanfare. Events would be noted in several titles. The world was dynamic and ever-changing. And most significantly, the changes were cumulative. They made a difference. If the FF's headquarters got wrecked one issue, the next issue would still be wrecked, and they'd have to cope with repairing it. If the Torch lost his girlfriend one issue, he'd still be pining for her the next. Things did not return to a dull, placid status quo in a Marvel comic. The world of Marvel comics was more like the real world than any comic book had ever been before. Besides events making a difference like in real life, there were real-world locales to the Marvel stories. Heroes and villains had true-to-life problems, and motives, and feelings. Powers seemed finite, down to earth enough to believe in. One actually got the feeling that if you lived in New York, you could probably look out the window and see Spider-Man swing by. Put all these things together, and you have a cohesive, believable setting, where each month you could participate in the lives of the Marvel heroes. This setting we've come to call the Marvel Universe. And that brings us to the official handbook of the Marvel Universe. This 12-part monthly series is our first attempt to catalog the wonderful and multifarious inhabitants and phenomena that exist within the Marvel Universe. No mere list of names is this. No dry recitation of basic facts either. Rather, it is a lavishly illustrated handbook filled with new artwork and more information than has ever before been revealed about the origins and powers of the Marvel superstars. So this is it. The last word on the Marvels of the Universe. From Abomination to Zacks, and maybe beyond. Hope you enjoy it. Mark Gruenwald, Editor. The Avengers... I remember them. Thor and Iron Man, Jan the Wasp. And that friend of hers, Henry Pym. I'm the Hulk, and I'm bigger and stronger than any of them. What happened to the intruder, Hulk? None of your blame business, fool. No matter how tough you are, that sort of talk is out. Quiet, rust pot. Hulk, you go too far. Easy, Thor, I'll handle it. Avengers should fight a common enemy, not each other. Stay out of this or you'll die. Are you going to let him get away with that? I'll teach you some manners, you green-tinted gargoyle. That's what you think. Cease your fighting at my command. What gives you the right to butt in like that? My irresistible voodoo hammer. Back! Back, I say! Hello, this is Angela from the Wonder Woman Warrior for Peace podcast. I'm here today to talk about the Avengers. What was your introduction to the Avengers as a concept? Oh, good grief. I started out reading classic 60s Spider-Man, so probably just some reference in there. Actually, you know what? Before I even started reading comics... 
there was a History Channel documentary about the history of comics. And I probably would have heard about them first there, because that's where I first heard about the death of Gwen Stacy. I mean, it was just a general overview of the history of comics from the first appearance of Superman until the early 2000s, I think. Probably just in documentary form. And also there was this team called the Avengers. Have you ever read any Avengers comics? Not before I started researching for this show. I can't think of any collections that I would have read that would have included any Avengers. I generally stick with individual heroes or, well, Fantastic Four, but not really any big crossovers that would have included them. You selected the Avengers to cover. What inspired you to make that selection? No one else had chosen it. And I was like, dude, I get to cover somebody as big as the Avengers. And then afterwards, when I got it, I was like, wait, what do I actually talk about? I have no idea. Now, have you seen the movies? Of course I've seen the movies. Come on. (laughs) There are holdouts. I could probably be considered a comics movie fan first and comics comics fan second, if we're being perfectly honest. It was this first Sam Raimi Spider-Man that made me go, oh, hey, this is cool. And then I found Spider-Man comics in the library and picked them up. Fantastic Four I read before the movie. Thor and Doctor Strange I read before the movies. A lot of stuff I didn't. No, I read at least one or two issues of Iron Man before his first movie. Probably not any Captain America or anything like that. So let's try kind of a speed round approach then. Uh, By the way, the overall entry is by John Byrne, who was one of the classic artists of the 1980s. You're only getting to see this via headshots, though. What do you think about the entry itself? It goes through all the different Avengers, starting at the very beginning. Avengers. Based in Manhattan, the Avengers are one of Earth's first and foremost organizations of costumed champions. The membership of the Avengers has changed over the years, although many of the founding members are still active. The individuals depicted below represent every active member since the Avengers inception, plus all other individuals who have been authorized to carry an Avengers Identicard. And then we have a blank Avengers Identicard, which I'm sure was meant for kids to cut out and put their own picture and name on it. I can vouch for that. Uh, In the final issue of the original volume of Official Handbook of the Marvel Universe, they had a full-color glossy version of that same image. There was more like life-size on the very last page, and I cut it out and I made my own Avengers ID card. That's cool. So the Avengers are listed in order of joining the team first lineup is thor iron man ant-man hulk and wasp in any media have you ever seen that lineup as the avengers or is that just something you're aware of from the comics i'm mostly aware of it from the comics i will say was it ant-man and the wasp the movie when we finally got to see hank and janet together i was just like oh this is so cool we finally have all the original avengers on screen I only watched Ant-Man and the Wasp the one time. I remember they did the CGI de Michelle Pfeiffer in the second one. And I think mm-hmm. that they recreated the mission from the first movie. But like I said, I saw it the one time. Yes. I don't remember all the finer details. I only saw it once, but they did recreate that at the beginning. Among the initial founding five Avengers, are Ant-Man and Wasp your favorites? Probably Thor, to be honest, just from a comic standpoint. I'm more of a fantasy fan than sci-fi, so I read a bunch of his original issues back in the day. Back in the day. (laughs) When I was a teenager and read more comics, I read a bunch of original Thor. Not so much Hulk, not so much Iron Man. You do have a one one podcast, so it's a safe inference to make, even if you hadn't told us directly. This is true. And then we have a little bit of a cheat because Hank Pym comes back again, this time as Giant Man. Oh, that guy has like, probably like 10% of these headshots are Hank Pym in his how many different incarnations. Good grief. I think Pym must be the man guy who has edited more, this. Man has more aliases than Gene Gray. <laughs> Any thoughts on Giant Man? Especially if you're watching it through the movies, you get both pretty much right off the bat. But there was a right. time where it was really thought of of Ant-Man and Giant Man being more distinct entities. Do you care about there being a Giant Man or do you just like Ant-Man being able to go back and forth? Ant-Man being able to go back and forth just seems simpler to me. I mean, really, you could pronounce it Giant man and it would work just as easily. I don't know if you've ever read Legion of Superheroes, but they had a character named Shrinking Violet, who eventually got the powers of the size-changing character Leviathan, and so she was Leviathan. Nice, nice. Then, of course, you have Cap's Kooky Quartet, where basically the entire founding lineup is replaced with Captain America, Hawkeye, Quicksilver, and Scarlet Witch. Captain America, there's a reason he was included as a founding member in the originals. I know he didn't come in until, like, number four, but he's such a core part of the team. He's almost an honorary founding member, really, especially since Hulk left, like, in issue two. Movie-wise, using Hawkeye was a good choice. I am a little disappointed, at least for the movies, that they killed Quicksilver so so early. Obviously, that was because of Fox owning the X-Men at the time, and they decided to split the twins up. I kind of wish they'd 
figured out a way to bring him back in Endgame since they now have the rights to the X-Men again, but maybe we'll see him in WandaVision. I actually floated the theory on one of the Marvel Superheroes podcasts that what they ought to do is give us some flashbacks to the X-Men having been around and show Mm -hmm. Magneto with his kids in Sokovia. Well, that would be cool. Have you had any exposure to Swordsman or Goliath? No. I mean, Goliath is just, again, Hank Pym, right? Chose a different name again? If I recall correctly, yeah. Because you've got Goliath 2 coming up later on, which is Hawkeye using Pym particles to become a giant man. Don't even ask you how that happened. I read some of that stuff and I still like, why did that happen again? I don't know. I was trying to read the Kree Scroll War to prepare for this. Hawkeye is giant man there. You remember that Hawkeye initiative from a few years ago? Yeah, no, he really did have a costume that skimpy back in the day. (laughs) What about Marvel's version of Hercules? I know you have a lot of experience with DC's version. How do you rate Marvel's? Maybe have read an issue or two with him in it. Just kind of remember he's more of a humorous character. Clearly a hero as opposed to in DC where he's usually depicted as a villain. Black Panther. I would have read his first issues back when I was reading Fantastic Four. Cool character. Great history with him. Interesting that they call him Chief of Wakanda instead of King of Wakanda there. I think they were still leaning into the tribalism. That might have been something from the 70s run. I've heard that Jack Kirby always depicted him as his mouth exposed like Batman, but they decided they didn't like that, so they inked over it. I've heard different things about that. They did not want to have the visage of a black man on the cover of the comic book for fear that it wouldn't fly in the south of the day. And they did try that for a little while in some Avengers comics of the late 60s. It always looked a little odd. The full face mask just makes him look more fearsome and and also less Batman-like. It kind of tames him a little bit, I feel like. He just looks so much more intimidating with the full face mask. This is true. Thoughts on Vision? Oh boy, I tried looking into his history once. Good grief. First he was the original Human Torch, then he wasn't, then there was some weird timeline split shenanigans where he was and he wasn't. For crying out loud, people. I love comics, but sometimes we can just overcomplicate things like nobody's business. And it was actually the guy who drew this entry who introduced all that I was actually built from the original Human Torch stuff in the late 80s. It's an interesting concept, but then if they want to go in and bring in the original Human Torch again, then it just makes things really confusing. His original origin was he was built by Ultron. He was basically he uh, like a been, sleeper agent being sent by Ultron to infiltrate the Avengers. Right. He would have been a villain just like Quicksilver, Scarlet Witch, and even Hawkeye. Interesting that for a while there you had four Avengers who used to be villains. And also they had the whole thing where his brain Ingrams were based on Wonder Man's. And I think they introduced that idea at a time when Wonder Man was dead, but they brought Wonder Man back. It just gets so confusing with this dude. I think we're at the last Hank Pym identity, Yellow Jacket. Of all the various Hank Pym identities, which is your favorite? Probably just Ant-Man because it's less confusing. I know later on they said, oh, well, he's got... It wasn't multiple personality, was it? He can't commit to anything or he can't... They tried to get make some excuse like he had a mental condition or just some weird personality quirk where he couldn't decide on anything. And that's why he kept changing his alias. I thought I read that. You can do broad brush stuff. Like Hulk is clearly a thing about don't let yourself get too angry and keep your rage in check. Same with Wolverine. But complicated stuff like that it has to be done delicately. Any associations with Black Knight? No. Sorry, no. Now, I understand they are going to try to bring him into some of the new movies. I heard something about Kit Harington maybe getting cast in that role. Right, for Eternals. The only thing I know about Eternals is that they're like Marvel's version of the new gods from DC, right? So it's taken us a long time to get to her, given how well represented she is in media. Oh, I like Black Widow. I remember reading Classic Spider-Man. I remember the issue where she went from her kind of more of a dress costume to the Emma Peel cat suit that was in some issue of Amazing Spider-Man. And that was a cool intro to her there. I like what they've done with her in the movies. I'm really looking forward to her solo movie. That should be awesome. It's so weird to be like Black Widow and then Mantis because they seem like they should be way further apart. Yeah. My first introduction to her was Guardians 2. Isn't she usually green? I've heard she's normally green, but they changed her for the movie so that nobody would mix her up with Gamora. She's a much different character in the comics than she is in the movies. It's Mm -hmm. a whole thing that we can't even get started on. So (laughs) let's talk about the Beast. Gotta love the Beast. Read him first for Uncanny X-Men, the Stan Lee run. I remember for the longest time being so confused how Beast went from this guy who looked like an ape 
to this blue furry guy. How did that happen? Why? What? I'm so confused. And finally, I managed to track down the history and I realized that, oh, well, he was experimenting on himself and he made himself less human looking. I don't know if he's supposed to be the next step in human evolution. I can understand why they made him look less like an ape. It is kind of cool, the idea of this monstrous looking guy who's actually this genteel scientist type. The X-Men cartoon I remember as a kid was X-Men Evolution, but I don't remember him particularly well. I'm sure he would have been in it, and it would have been the blue furry version. But comics-wise, I read more 60s era before he looked like that. Moondragon? She looks like that chick from Star Trek The Motion Picture. That's all I got. I tend to think of her as a defender. It always is weird for me when she's in the context of the Avengers. Now, Miss hmm. Marvel, though, I'm sure you got a little bit more of a handle. A little bit. Obviously, I know her more post-becoming Captain Marvel. I don't know. I saw her movie. It was fine. I believe the review I gave, this was my least favorite Phase 1 movie until I remember that Incredible Hulk was a Phase 1 movie. Let's talk about the Avengers. Next up is Falcon. He seems cool. Looking forward to see what they do with him and Bucky in their show. I will say I adored, was it the beginning of Civil War? Where Red Bird, was it Red Bird? His, his pet? Red Wing. Where they turned Red Wing into a drone. That was so perfect. That was Jarvis as an AI levels of perfect updating. I'm not talking to the bird. Wonder Man. That's the Earth 3 version of Wonder Woman, right? Right. <laughs> Isn't that that guy Dr. Psycho hey, became hey. in the pre-crisis? Yeah, that's it. My I, understanding I, I is he Wonder actually Man. has appeared in the Marvel Cinematic Universe in deleted material from, I think it was Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, Plus, really? Who played Mal Reynolds on Firefly? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Nathan Fillion. Yes. My understanding is there's still some images of him in the movie representing Simon Williams as a B-list actor. Huh. I remember he voiced one of the aliens in the prison. I'm sorry, I don't know anything about Wonder Man. He's one of my least favorite Avengers. Just know that his brain Ingrams helped to create the vision. I don't imagine Tiger is very familiar to you. The only thing I can think is that she's a Marvel version of... Um... Is it Vixen from DC? It's a Catwoman superhero character. There's tons of them. She-Hulk, she was a fourth wall breaker before even Deadpool, right? I would say that like Deadpool, she stole her bit from Ambush Bug, but she definitely was the okay. first Marvel character that did that on the regular. I haven't read any of her issues. No, they're making a show for her. That should be cool. Oh, no. People want to sue Bruce Banner for all the damage that he caused. And he'll say, oh, yeah, call my cousin. She's a lawyer. Captain Marvel 2, you've had a little bit of exposure to. A uh, just tiny bit. I was astonished that you had a black female Captain Marvel superhero leading the Avengers in, was it the 70s? Early 80s? Okay. Still, I remember back in the day, back in the day, like 2010, people saying, oh, there's no diversity in comics, there's no diversity in comics, and like Miles Morales, hey, this is the first diversity. No, we've had it all the way back to the 80s. Good grief. Why does nobody know about Monica Marambo? Oh, she's definitely a sleeper in terms of favorite characters. Her solo entry, she's probably one of, if not the single most desired characters when I was figuring out who was going to do what entries and offering them to various people. Four or five people. I can understand. Star Fox. No, I usually played Kirby in Super Smash Bros. I love how we have this little placeholder portion where they just drop in a little bit of text saying special status. Note the following members of the Guardians of the Galaxy were issued temporary Avengers IDs during their stay in this time. Vance Astro, Charlie 27, Martin X, Nikki, Starhawk, and Yondu. And you know, like, one of those people, right? I do know that it was the end of Guardians 2 where they had all of those characters make an appearance, right? Absolutely right. Throughout the history of Marvel Comics, for the most part, these guys were perpetual footnotes. And again, they don't even get headshots in the Avengers entry because Hank Pym needed those spots. <laughs> Accurate. Look, I was into comics for probably at least 10 years before they announced, so we're making Guardians of the Galaxy movie, and I was like, who? I've never heard of these characters. So the fact that they managed to make that work was absolutely mind-blowing. So we kind of already touched on Jarvis, but how about Rick Jones? To try to prepare for this, I read Marvel Masterworks Avengers. I did not realize that he's supposed to be the spitting image of Bucky. Uh, that's what Cap said in his first issue back. He mistook him for Bucky for a second there. The perpetual sidekick. He hangs out with people, but isn't really much of a hero himself, is what I understand. Did you manage to finish Kree Scroll I War? I didn't finish it. I got through most of it. He's key to the resolution of that. So that's like one of his shining moments. I can't think of a single live action incarnation. Was he? Have I seen any of the Lou Ferrigno show? I don't think I have. I don't think he's in there. He's in this weird place where he's a little too high profile to just throw at one of the TV shows, but he's way too low mm -hmm. profile for anybody to really care to use him in a movie. You would think that he'd have showed up somewhere by now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Hellcat. From Jessica Jones. Patsy Walker. Wasn't she one of the romance comics or the fashion comics or something back in the 60s and then they decided to bring her into the superhero universe? 
Absolutely. She was also teen comedy. So she did Archie and then she did Katie Keene and then she did Superheroine. Eventually she even got into horror through her husband of the time, Damon Hellstrom. So she's the biggest genre burster of just about any character in comics. She's done it all. Yeah. Nice. I only saw the first season. I looked it up. I'm like, man, why did I not continue Daredevil season two? I looked, I'm like, oh, the first episode of Daredevil season two was like the same day I started my podcast. She was a good character. Loved her friendship with Jessica. Maybe the later seasons, they made her more of a superhero and maybe gave her a costume. There was a time where I had seen every on-screen thing for the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and that has not been the case for many years now. <laughs> Henry Peter Gyrick. I have no idea who this person is. He looks vaguely like a Green Lantern with the sunglasses. And then the last okay. two are going to be Jocasta and Captain Marvel. And again, these are really very comic-centric characters. Anything on them? She was associated with the Fantastic Four, right? I know her from the Avengers, and I, and she's another one that Ultron built. She's like the Bride of Ultron. I don't know if she ever okay. had anything to do with the Fantastic Four. I might be mixing her up with that robot they had in the cartoon. Herbie? Oh, <laughs> uh, let me do a quick Google here. I mean, her name is from Greek mythology. I know that much. Oh, she's Oedipus's mom in Greek mythology. That's where I know her from. Going back to the more family-friendly comics version where she's a fembot. <clears throat> Sought help from the Fantastic Four, befriended them in Alicia Masters, fought with Thing against Ultron. I don't know, I probably checked out some DK visual history of Fantastic Four at some point and saw a picture over there back before all this info was on Wikipedia. Captain Marvel, mostly I know the complicated history of that superhero name with Marvel and DC and Fawcett. Other than the bit in Kree Scroll War, I don't know much about him. This is just 1983. How many more pages would this make up if they were trying to do that today? I think it would actually probably be as big as my essential edition to try to cover all the Avengers at this point. Oh, good grief. If you're just doing the Avengers, not the Mighty Avengers or the Dark Avengers or the New Avengers or the Young Avengers or the... How many variations ever since, what is it, Avengers Disassemble, where they broke up the main team and had 20 spinoffs? As an old school fanboy, that was one of the moments that broke Marvel Comics for me, was when everybody yeah. suddenly became an Avenger. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's the Avengers. Great team. I didn't have this firsthand experience, but I understand for the longest time they were considered the B team in comics to the Justice League, although clearly that has switched the last 10 years. I think that was true in the early days, but by the end of the 60s, I really think that Avengers were head and shoulders above the JLA. Marvel in general so overwhelmed the marketplace. Obviously, there wouldn't be an Avengers without a Justice League, but it makes sense that the Avengers have been so successful translating the film because the comic books in terms of their continuity in terms of their handling of the characters has always been more sophisticated had a stronger connection to the audience for longer so i will always be more of a just league fan than avengers fan but i just have to acknowledge the body of work they have to draw from for the marvel movies is much stronger and has broader appeal yeah i started out in comic dumb as a marvel only snob dc everything they did sucked and marvel was the best i would say now that i'm a little older a lot older i like dc's individual heroes more but I think I like Marvel's teams more, if that makes any sense. Oh, no, it absolutely makes sense. For starters, they actually invested in having a variety of teams. Again, that's one of the things yeah. that I mourn about everything being Avengers now, is they used to have so many distinct teams. Their own flavors, their own vibes, their own members. Mm -hmm. Then going into the 2000s, all of a sudden, half the X-Men are in the Avengers and vice versa. It, it erodes that. Where DC, really, you've got Justice League, you've got Titans, you've got Legion. Yeah. I mean, I watched the Justice League cartoon a bit as a kid, but again, at that point, I was like, hey, everything DC sucks. Marvel's the best. I'm an obnoxious teenager. Maybe I should redo that where I don't put on a stupid voice. <laughs> oh. Anyway, thanks for coming and welcome to Avengers Mansion. This was my... You know, that was really rude. Greetings, Thor Odinson. May I offer you a drink? What manner of palace is this? This was a museum for the Maria Stark Foundation, my mother's home. I've had it upgraded since the breakout. I thought this could be our headquarters. Swanky. The mansion is run by Jarvis, my personal artificial intelligence. Anything you need, Jarvis will provide. Say hi, Jarvis. Indeed. We've got a full kitchen, chef on call. There are 12 bedrooms, maid service, laundry, room service. A theater slash lounge, satellite TV and movies, every form of video entertainment on the planet. Are you serious, Stark? This is what you spent a week preparing? Uh, no. I haven't gotten to the good stuff yet. Hello, 
Hello there. This is Paquita Tratamundos. Sometimes I appear on one song each side B. Today, I'm going to be talking about the Avengers Mansion, located at 7021 Fifth Avenue between 70 and 71st Street in New York City. This is a multi-story, multi-basement mansion. They have room for many, many things like planes, training room, a massive, very old computer that uses two gigabytes of RAM for like major robotic projects. <laughs> they even have a submarine. The original mansion was built by Howard Stark in 1932 and since then has been modified a couple times to accommodate the new technological eras. It is powered by a uh, General Electric 4 generation SNAP. So what's a SNAP? It's a system nuclear applications. 100,000 kilowatts. Thermoelectric generator, which is back it up by a conventional fuel power generator, which is in turn, backed up by a large array of exotic high density batteries. They didn't give too much description, so I don't know what the exotic batteries will look like. All this power is to make sure that they don't lose any information. On the basements they have all sorts of training rooms, computer rooms, robotic fabrication section, gymnasiums, simulation rooms, a uh, lot of restrooms. Apparently on the third floor, you can actually fit three airplanes, Avengers Queen Jets. They use a combination of steel and concrete for reinforcement. The R, the one who actually designed this floor plan is Elliot R. Brown. So which one do I like better? This one or the Stark Tower? I have to say the Stark Tower, but it doesn't give too much information either on the movies on how it's exactly built. But yeah, that's it. So that's the mansion. I hope you like it. Thank you, guys. We have soldiers willing to sacrifice, but they need weapons. The enemy has the advantage. We need one of our own. You risk that for a Quinjet? No. For what we can do with one. Disappear. Become ghosts. That's how we have to live now. In the shadows. To save people, even when they don't know it. Hey, it's the Legal Machine from the Rolls by and Podcast, and I'm here to talk to you about the Avengers Quinjet. Is there such a thing as a Quinjet, or is it just from the comics? This is just from the comics. Why is it called a Quinjet? I don't remember. What is Quinn even as a suffix? Shouldn't that be in this entry? You'd think. A Quinn is apparently a five. Got its name from its five jet thrusters. Wow. How about that? Stark International Quinjet A1, United States Wakandan Design Group, T'Challa Chieftain. Is this from the Bushima years? Well, let's find when its first appearance was. I always associate it with the Bushima years. Avenger number 61. Maximum level speed at sea level is Mach 2.1. Did you know that? Is that good? Did you know that its max rate of climb at S slash L sea level is 7,900 feet per minute? I don't know what that means relative to what we can do now. Have we advanced past the Quinjet at this point? Or is uh, the Quinjet still... You know what, dude? I doubt it. Tons of our fleet is surprisingly old. I still think the SR-71 that got discontinued a couple decades ago still holds most of these benchmarks for speed and height. The technology stopped focusing on speed and rate of climb and more its ability to hide from radar and its weapon systems. I think they stopped evolving in certain ways. The versatility of this vehicle, land wherever, take off from wherever, it's still impressive, I'm sure. Definitely. And Mach 2.1 isn't anything to sneeze at either, I expect. Oh, quite fast, quite fast. So a Pratt and Whitney turbojet, is that a real thing? Pratt and Whitney's a aerospace company, engine makers, like Rolls Royce or whatever. No, no, it's real. The J48 is a real turbine that has been used on applications such as the Grumman F9F-5 Panther the Lockheed F-94C Starfire, which was a first-generation jet aircraft for the United States Air Force, developed from the twin-seat Lockheed T-33 shooting star in the late 1940s. That is a real turbine. And then it also lists the afterburner that it uses, which is real, too, the Pratt & Whitney J-57. I like the Elliot R. Brown design. It, it looks legit with all the different compartments and colors and numbers that line up with specs. looks legit. It looks like one of those manuals I used to buy for my cars that I would never use. The Chilton's or Haynes guide? It's funny you said that because when I was looking through Google Images, for Quinjet pictures, somebody made a faux Chilton's guide for the Quinjet. Bluish cover with the square in the middle with the picture of the Quinjet. And then it's even got the yellow ribbon across the top where it would say Haynes or Chilton's guide or whatever. I laughed out loud, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Tickled my nostalgia nerve there. What do you think about the Quinjet as an iconic superhero 
heroic vehicle. It's solidly fifth or sixth place. All of comics, it's probably outside the top ten, right? I'm thinking, yeah. But definitely in Marvel, I think it's pretty iconic. I still say it's outside the top five in Marvel. You got the Blackbird, the Fantastic Car. You got the Helicarrier. You got Silver Surfer's Surfboard. I don't know. But it's definitely ahead of something like, say, Moon Knight's helicopter. Sure. It's ahead of Thanos' helicopter. <laughs> They have enough weird vehicles in DC that it definitely knocks this one down a few. Another thing that bothers me about this, too, is I think that the Quinjet in the movies is so bland. Charcoal gray, which I know is supposed to make it look covert ops or whatever, but it looks like some sort of knockoff G.I. Joe toy. I think the Quinjet in the comic books with the color and the shape is like really unique looking. There's really short wings. I always loved the way it looked in the comics. It looked so different. Dude, the movie Quinjet sucks. <laughs> <laughs> And like you said, they really missed the opportunity to toyify it. Action figures is a huge part of these movies, and I don't understand why you couldn't make a decent-looking Quinjet. Like, this thing looks whack. It looks terrible. What a huge missed opportunity, in my opinion. Maybe they think it looks cooler. Maybe they, maybe the one in the comic books looks dorky, and I strongly disagree. I think it looks great. I think that both those statements could be true, and they still need to do a better movie one. Yeah, I mean, I guess the color is weird. Them flying a bright white jet around would look strange. Just, you know, like in Civil War, where they're trying to be all covert and everything. I feel like you could change the paint color, and it would still look pretty cool. It's comics anything that was white could potentially be silver you know if alex ross yeah. the quinjet it's going to be a silver jet that would be cool chrome, make it be like chrome, chrome or whatever chrome. like yeah the, that that like would be a flight of the navigator they're still competing with bat wings and stuff kid will buy a bat wing or, or whatever batman is going to fly and whatever batman is driving don't you want some of that money marvel don't you want yeah, a little exactly. bit more money you don't have enough yet right and outside of iron man's armor that's really this is really the only thing they got because they don't have captain america's motorcycle nobody cares and hawkeye i don't know what he, he doesn't write it. i guess he just piggybacks on people or whatever they went all out on the helicarriers those sitting fairly true to form super let down but whatever i like it in the comic books it's cool that's all i got dude uh, who the hell are these guys you boys lost i'm ascension chronicom from the planet chronica 2 good for you now beat it before we make you freaks regret being born chronicoms are not born Warning you. Last chance, pal. Take them, boys! Diablo Frank again, closing out the first issue of the official handbook of the Marvel Universe. If you've ever watched the latter seasons of Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., you're familiar with the Chronicoms. When they were introduced, they were a synthetic life form made up of basically explorers, scientists, and the like. The timeline got messed up, and the race basically became a bunch of Terminators, like from the movies. And they're sort of the bad guys that are closing out the series. Now, the Chronicoms were created for the TV show. And when they were first introduced in scientist mode, I thought they were a lot like the recorders. But now that they've turned evil I'd say they're more like the autocrons but to tell you about the autocrons I have to go all the way back to when Jack Kirby left Marvel Comics he went to DC did the New Gods and the Fourth World stuff that didn't work out great and he came back and it was weird because everybody was mad at him for betraying Marvel and yet they also thought he was out of fashion so it's like you're mad at him even though you don't want him because you don't think he can sell whatever the case may be once he got back to Marvel as he had been doing in his latter part of the time at DC he was mostly focusing on his own original creation but he would take on some odds and sods and one of the things he did was an adaptation of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Now that was a big sci-fi movie in the late 60s. People who were big fans of the movie include Stanley Kubrick fans classical music fans and acid aficionados. It's a weird movie. It's not the most sensical of movies and so when you're trying to continue the story of a movie that's ending is highly debatable you know even what it is can be tricky. What Kirby initially did was he followed the star child as he went on these cosmic adventures this like space fetus. I read one of those comics when I was a kid and it's one of the reasons why for my entire childhood and to a degree even to adulthood I kind of keep Kirby at arm's length his 70s output just did not do it for me for the most part but toward the end of his adaptation he introduced a new concept these robots they were supposed to be replacements for soldiers in like the Vietnam War for instance but the problem is the robots these artificial life forms that were created on earth they couldn't hack it and so they would have breakdowns and all of them were ordered to self-destruct all but one did there was one of these machines that was given a human consciousness that basically was given 
given an imprintation of like childhood and development and everything else. I believe it was the scientist mind that was put into this body. And then unfortunately, the scientist was removing the self-destruct and it blew up on him. So his consciousness survives inside the robot. This robot ultimately becomes known as Machine Man. And after the 2001 series ends, he carries on into his own relatively short-lived series. So Robot Man is sort of like Johnny Five is Alive, like Short Circuit. He's not just a robot, but the government thinks he is. And so there's this dude who's his General Thunderbolt Ross, Colonel Craig, who's looting his men to try to destroy this rogue robot. And so he, he's running around trying to avoid capture. Machine Man is like the most powerful guy in the Marvel Universe. You give him four wheels and he'll turn into a car. It's crazy. So he's on the run and he hooks up with this psychiatrist guy. Really random, I know. He ends up going back to the institution with the scientist. And there's a dude in the institution who keeps screaming about intergalactic communications and stuff. They just think he needs more Thorazine. But Machine Man actually understands what he's talking about and he realizes this dude is getting signals from outer space. And so Machine Man works with the design that he gets from this dude and he creates this device that opens up a dimensional portal. I did mention Machine Man is the most powerful guy in the Marvel Universe. He can basically go through and draw something from the farthest reaches of the universe and then bring it to Earth. Well, the whole time this alien consciousness has been possessing the inmate and he's been a total jerk very arrogant and demanding everything else he wants to swap places with the human and just leave the human to die because the consciousness is trapped on a spaceship that's being drawn into a sun and that's why he's freaking out machine man's like you know no i'm not gonna kill some guy just to save you i'll just save both of you and so he creates the initial portal and he brings the guy in and the dude is 10 for the mean machine and boy that is a perfect title for this jerk i'm 10 for full cost specialist first class so the art in the official handbook of the Marvel Universe by Patty is extremely deceptive. It only vaguely resembles any of the autocrons. For starters, it makes them look really short, not remotely true. These guys are big, like 10 feet tall, okay? They're gray. They're all metal. They're robots. Again, these guys have all kinds of parts and stuff to them, just like Machine Man does. Why are you so concerned about these mobile sacks of tissue? As a fellow autocron, you will both all should understand the mean machine mistakes machine man for an autocron and starts zapping the humans with paralysis rays and dispatching them as though they're nothing and machine's like whoa 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 you know that's not cool and 10 is like no man we're, we're all about smashing the flesh suits <sighs> i've seen your trainers time before they patronize and serve these flesh wearers for a few crumbs of tolerance you look like an autocron but you smell like a flunky in my galaxy Show the contempt you deserve. And that's when they start fighting. Now, the weird thing about 10-4 is he doesn't have any reason to hate humanity besides just it's specious. He's a robot dude and he hates all humans just automatically. He's like Bender or something. And so as soon as he realizes he's a world of these fleshlings, he's like, smash it up, smash it up. No other motivation for that. And then he gets mad because he sees Machine Man as sort of like a race trader. It's like, you know, no, you're supposed to be helping me smash these guys up. You're supposed to be helping me rule this planet. And he recognizes this is a backwater. The Autocrons don't even know this place exists. Machine Man and 10-4 fight and fight and fight eventually 10-4 says two things one that he's basically powered by nuclear fission and so he can blow up the whole planet really if he wanted to and also because he's gotten so mad at machine man he's called for the autocron armada to come in and just dominate our solar system and machine man is struggling because he's mad at the human race they're constantly hounding him he's got to got a hulk thing going on there but what really ticks him off is that colonel Craig shows up and mean machine just like totally lies to the military he's just like yeah man this machine man he's gone nuts and he's a total psycho and you know take me to your leader and we'll be all peaceful and stuff and the whole time he's grinning because he knows the evil armada is coming and machine man's like dudes and they're like but we're here to capture you and so he's like forget this and he runs off and he hangs out with a bunch of actors and he moans about his lack of human flesh and stuff it's (sighs) 70s Seventies. Eventually, Machine Man comes around. He goes after Ten Four. They have a big fight. He loses his arm. He gets his arm ripped off. Finally, he's like, "Okay, the Armada's coming. The only thing I can do is I'm gonna rewire Ten Four. I'm gonna use my dimensional warper thing to shoot him at to where the Armada's gonna be, and then I'm gonna make him detonate and take out the whole Armada, just like genociding the Autocrons, or at least that uh, Armada. And that's the end. That's how it wraps up. Now, if you look in most books, they'll tell you that Ten Four's first appearance is in Machine Man number. 
number three. That's not true. It's actually number two. It's just that his consciousness is within the human being. And there's also a bunch of listings for him having appearances in later books, but he blows up at the end of his four issue story arc. So no, technically it's five issues. There are other auto crimes, and I assume just there's some visual resemblance there. And so those got to be other guys because 10 is dead. So one of the ones we've seen, although very briefly, is 1034. This guy was created to fill a few early pages of an issue of Avengers by Jerry Ordway and Kurt Busiek. He basically has the same powers and abilities as 104, but again, Busiek obviously read Ohatmu, probably was aware this dude was dead, and so he just made another one. And this dude apparently pops up in some issues of Maximum Security, but the thing is, they established that Autocrons have a vulnerability to Sonics, and so Iron Man just hits him with a bunch of decibels and knocks him out, takes this dude out in a few pages. No arc for you. And then the other one is Fabricant, and he looks a little more organic and he wears clothes. So he gets introduced, I believe, in an issue of Quasar, and it's all part of the setup for the Star Blast crossover. Mark Grunewald was one of the architects of the new universe, and he couldn't let it go. And so he has this energy device called the Star Brand that makes it into the Marvel Universe, and all these people are fighting over it. And one of those people is Lord Skeletron, who is apparently not an autocron. He's, I guess, organic and robotic, but he's like really tight buds with the autocrons because they're both like, let's smash everything. They're simpatico. And so his trusted manservant, essentially, or eh, it's his lieutenant, it's his second in command, is this fabricant dude. So he pops up in Star Blast, he pops up in Quasar. I don't know if he survives or not. He's silly looking, but he manages to get a handful of appearances, including an issue of uh, Fantastic Four that tied into Star Blast. Autocrons are another one of those universe breakers. Every single member of this race is supposed to have an A-bomb built into them. And yet these guys are jobbers in the Marvel Universe for some weird reason. Scary for cover, you petty skin carrion. When Autocron steps, there he rolls. Oh, and I forgot to mention the way that Machine Man beats 10-4 is instant robot hypnosis. Machine Man is insane. The official listeners of the Marvel Handbook Podcast are... The 108 Sage, Between the Pages, Brother Knight, Caroline Wells, Chris Dunford said, This is going to be a good one. Christopher Bush, Sarah Place, Komi Koskop, Daniel French Fishbonius Sound Design, Darren and Ruth Sutherland, Delvin, Derek William Crabb, Doc Strange, Dear Cashton said thank you RSB, Ed Moore, Fiendish Fitz, FSD Records, Guido, Gui Not Gui, The Hammer Strikes, Random Geeky Stuff, History of Comics on Film, I was Joe Crawford, Jax Webb, Jeffrey Brown, Jennifer DeRoss, Jim Imbruglia, Carl Ottersberg said, Thanks, Keith G. Baker, Kenny Crowley Jr., Carolyn, KSCGSF Podcast, Law Dog, Posting from an Undisclosed Location, Luke J. Canetti of Earth Destruction Directive, Mariana, Marvel Universe Online, who offered up thanks and their Black Widow entry, Rich Admar Felman 76, Michael Robert, My Time, Mike It Send Aliens to Me, Odell Abner Dracula, Rad Adventures, Randy Caldwell, Resurrections, and Adam Warlick and Thonos Podcast, Richard G. added, Thank you for the inclusion, love that you include me with other comic fans, Ryan Daly is injecting sunlight, Scott Free, Secret Wars and Beyond Podcast, Siskoid, who added, my favorite part was Paquita talking about the real-world engineering of Black Widow's gear. I love that kind of stuff. Paquita Trotamundo's reply, Thanks Siskoid, Ranger Gord, Third Rail Design Lab, Post Human RPG, Tim Price the Podcrasher, Trekker Talk, Varric Wong, Warlord Worlds, Wonder Woman, Warrior for Peace Podcast, X32, Diana, and Xenozoic Xenophiles. All characters and concepts appearing in the official handbook of the Marvel Universe and the distinct likenesses thereof are the trademark and copyright of Marvel Entertainment LLC, a subsidiary of the Walt Disney Company. This has been a non-for-profit fan production from Rolled Spine Podcast. Any copyrighted material presented herein are presumed covered under fair use, with no infringement intended. Till next time, Excelsior!